Okay, today's stuff we're going to be learning is Kiddusha and Daf Kaf Gimel. There's also a study guide for today. Um, today's stuff is sponsored by Yaakov Mayberg in loving memory of the victims of terror in Israel in August 2023. And in honor of the remarkable Aviva Tesler, she's dedicated her life to providing care and support to both the victims and their families through her organization, Operation Embrace. Today's stuff is sponsored for the Refua Shlema of Anat Rachel Bapnina, hoping that the Hadron learners learning for her will bring Chizuk and Refua. Okay, we're going to get started now with the end of yesterday's stuff. I'm going to go over the last section because I realize that I don't think I explained it properly. So, Tanu Rabbanam, we ended with the section about Ketzad Bechazaka. How do you do a Kenyan through Chazaka? So we said, we're talking about an Eved Ivri, a Gentile slave. Remember the rules about a Gentile slave? A Gentile slave basically becomes part of your household, does a Brit Milah, he gets circumcised. Um, he's, he's almost like a Jew. What's the only thing missing? That he doesn't... He doesn't have to do, no, he's not a full-fledged Jew for two issues. Number one, he can't be married to a Jew or have relations with a Jew, only with Shifcha Knani, like another Canaanite slave like him. And he also has to keep all the mitzvot, but not the mitzvot that are time-bound. So they're somewhat Jewish. When do they actually become fully Jewish? Only if you release them. Upon their release, they become Jewish. Okay, that's what happens. You're not supposed to release them, all that. The question is, how do you acquire? So I purchase, let's say, a Canaanite slave. At what point is it clear that this is my slave and right? it's now, we can't change our minds about the deal. It's a done deal. So we had all these ways that if he takes off my shoes, if he starts doing something that shows that he works for me, the last thing on that list was he could be hope. If I lift him, if he lifts me up, okay? He's the slave, he carries me. That's a way of showing he works for me because he's carrying me. Why else would he be carrying me? To which we have Rabbi Shimon, who seems to disagree and says, Lo Now, lifting could mean one of two things. In our case, we were talking about lifting, that the slave lifted me, showing that he works for me. right? Just like Chazaka on land is by working the land. I start planting or plowing. And Chazaka by Evid is showing he works for me. But Hagbaha is also a type of acquiring in a different realm, which is, what is Hagbaha? If I buy something from you, I raise it up, that already means it's mine. And what they say here, Rabbi Shimon saying, Lote hagbaha. You can't give Chazaka more power than Hagbaha. Okay, we're going to see what this means in a minute. But it's based on the fact that Hagbaha has certain things that other types of Kinyanim don't have. Just often if I pull something, it's mine, but not if it's in, I'm still in the store or the, the domain of the person who I'm purchasing it from. Whereas Hagbaha, if I lift it up, even in the, in, the, in the seller's domain, I actually can acquire it, which means it's a very strong chazaka. So what does this have to do with anything? So now that Rav Aja is going to explain, because it's not clear what happens, and we're going to go back to this last time we said yesterday. So Tanakama says, It was listed in the list of all kinds of ways the slave is acquired, where the slave does work for me. So if the slave picks me up, then it shows he works for me. But he be ho rabo lo. But what if I lift the slave up? Just like I lift up uh, an object that I purchase. What if I lift the slave up? Comes the Tanakama. In other words, again, this is the assumption the Tanakama is saying. He be ho rabo lo kno. If, the, if I lift a slave to show I own him, that's not, that's not one of the ways that we acquire slaves. To which Rabbi Shimon says, what are you talking about? I'm a Rabbi Shimon. What do you mean I can't lift up the slave and with that show ownership? No. Just, if Chazaka works by a slave, of course Hagbaha works because Hagbaha is a very strong type of Kenyan. So therefore, Rabbi Shimon disagrees with Tanakama and says, you can totally lift up your slave and show ownership. Those are two totally different things. One is, I can, if the slave lifts me up, that shows he works for me. That's a Kenyan Chazaka. And on the flip side, I can actually lift the slave and show with that, I'm acquiring him not through Chazaka, but through Hagba. So basically, there's a machloka between them about the case where the master lifts up the slave. Does that show He's acquiring him the way you would acquire an object and lift it up, or no? That's the machlok between Rabbi Shimon and Tanakam. Sorry that I didn't explain it properly yesterday. Okay, now the Gemara continues with a very bizarre question. So we're se- seven lines from the bottom of Kaf Ben Amud Ben. 
Now, going back to the Tanakam, who said that if the Eved lifts the Adon, which we kind of thought it meant, right, carrying, we talked about yesterday, I think that, you know, the Romans used to carry people in chairs, you know, so let's say they lift me up in a chair, and that shows he works for me. Well, on that same note, even though it's really not the same note at all, you might be surprised by this next line, You're missing something in the list. You could have said that a female slave woman, if the owner has relations with her, with the intent of, inquire, of acquiring her as a slave through the relations, that first of all, he's not allowed to do that. But let's say he did anyway. Okay, you're not allowed to just have relations with the shikach nani. The master can't sleep with his Canaanite slave. But let's say he did. Okay, apropos, the first news story today was about a story of uh, a rape. Um, some Israelis were accused of raping uh, some woman anyway. I think it was in Cyprus, in that vein, you can imagine the scene. So the, the Adon, if he has relations with this Shifcha Knani, now it's not clear here if it's consensual, not consensual, in the minute you're going to see they think it's actually consensual, it wasn't rape. So now, Now what happens when you have relations? Okay, this is a little weird to think about and what exactly they mean by this, but she in essence is lifting the master through doing that. That's what the, the commentary is playing, okay? Or... Again, maybe you could say the opposite. Maybe it's a way of his showing ownership. I own you. I can have relations with you, which again, it's not exactly, this isn't something we believe in and we think should be done. But what they're saying is, if it is done, theoretically, it should work. To which they say, no, you're comparing apples and oranges. Why is that? This doesn't show his ownership over her, okay? Whether it's because she lifted him somehow, right? That's not what we were talking about with lifting, and this is why we think this must have been consensual. It's saying, in the case where he lifts up his master and carries him, it's painful for him to be doing this. You'd only do that if you were a slave. So when he lifts up his master, the master benefits, and and he's struggling. That's a normal relationship. This doesn't sound so nice, but it's a normal relationship. Slave works hard to do things that are beneficial for the master. But in sexual relations between the master and his and his servant, the assumption is she's enjoying the process and therefore it's not that she's working for him. Again, there's many ways to understand this. Is it because they're just assuming? We're talking about that the question was asked about if they decided both of them to have relations together. If he forces her, then obviously she's not nehene, and then maybe that would be the same thing. But anyway, this is sort of one of these kind of crazy theoretical questions, right? Oh, lifting? Well, she kind of lifts him while they're having relations, so wouldn't that be counted as the same thing? Which they think, by the way, when they ask this question, that it's an, obviously it's not true. That's not a way of acquiring. They're, they're trying to bring an absurd case to say something in the logic doesn't fit here. If lifting works to acquire, well, then you're going to come to this ridiculous conclusion that if he has, um, if he has the, um, the, if he has the, um, if she, right, this whole concept of lifting sounds like it doesn't really work because of course that wouldn't work if he did it with her. So anyway, there's a, there's a, an interesting, uh, it's, it's sort of just theoretical. And that's, I think the only way to really understand the sugya. To which they answer, they, they're still kind of at it because they love these theoretical questions. If you're saying she benefited and enjoyed, well, then if it's shaloka kedarka, well, ma'ika lememer. In the case where it's anal intercourse, that's not pleasurable for her. And then maybe really, it would be that she would acquire. She would be acquired in this way. How do you know it's not been pleasurable for the woman? The odd, the case that were beneficial right before I met, pleasurable. The odd, mishkave yishakti, shakatuv kedarka, lishalo kedarka. And anyway, it says mishkeve isha in a pasuk, which is a plural of as if there's multiple ways to have relations with women, which already we learned many times. That shows that shalom kedarka is the same as kedarka. Okay, anal intercourse is viewed the same as regular. And therefore, if we're going to say that this, again, was probably a consensual relationship and it wasn't him showing his prowess, her, you know, the heat kind of is in charge of her, then basically that's why it doesn't work. It would, it would be the same whether it's be a shagadarka or be a shalokadarka. So done with that very bizarre question and moving on to another issue about this. Rabbi Yehuda Hindua, 
Okay, what that means is from India or maybe some other land. There's different opinions. Anyway, he was a ger she'en lo yorshim hava. He was a ger that had no heirs. What happens in that case? Well, all of his property becomes ownerless upon his death. Chalash, he was actually very sick. Al Marzutra the Shiulebe. Marzutra went to see how he was doing. Chazi de Tekafle Al Matuba, he saw that he was about to die. Amar Leila Avde. Now, Marzutra says the following This guy's going to die any minute. His slave is going to become ownerless. I want to be the one who gets his slave. But what's the problem? Well, we learned this already in Gitin, and uh, sorry, was it Gitin? Yeah, in Gitin, that when a gear dies and his slave becomes ownerless, immediately, this is when we talk about these slaves in Gitin, immediately the slave becomes free, okay? Because the moment he becomes ownerless, he gains rights to himself. Now, Mazurcha wanted to preclude this from happening because he wanted the slave to be his. So what did he do? He wanted, normally, at the moment of death, the slave goes free. But if at the moment of death of the owner, the slave is still working, then he doesn't automatically go free. And then Marzutra can say, ah, well, now you don't belong to anybody. I'm going to acquire you. And that's what he wanted to do. So what did he do? Amar Le'la'avde said to the servant of Rabbi Yehuda and said, Shlof li mesane v'amtinu lebeta. Take off my shoes and go bring them to my house. And that way he'd be working when Rabbi Yehuda died. Ike de Amre. Now there's two versions to the story. Some people say Gadol Haya, that he was already of age, the servant, which means that he could acquire himself. And that was the whole reason why Marzutra did this. Because if he was a minor, well, minors can't acquire themselves, and it would have needed to be done. And ze peresh le mitav, ze peresh le chayim. So because he was of age, basically as soon as Rabbi Yehuda died, Marzutra gained life, which means he gained a slave. Okay, that's it's a weird way of saying it. I think they're just trying to say something that sounds like a good quip. He went to die, he went to life, and you know he was able to get the slave. The Ika de Amri, some people say Katan Habe. He was a minor. Well, then why did he have to do this whole thing? Because a minor can't acquire himself. Well, Udelo Kabashal. You might remember we learned this. This follows the opinion that's not Abashal's opinion, who says, Ditanya, Ger Shemate, this we learned in Gitim, Ubizbizu Yisrael Nechasav. Okay, so a ger dies. Again, we're talking about, we, I didn't review all this because we learned it not long ago. When a ger dies, if he had no children after the conversion, okay, but he had children who converted with him, or he had children who were not Jewish at all, then the, he has no heirs. So everything of his becomes ownerless. The Jews come and start taking his possessions, because they can't. And there were slaves there. According to Tanakama, and this is according the one who says the slave was a minor, well, what I said before wasn't true, actually. According to this opinion, even a minor goes free immediately. Okay, in other words, it's like a, an automatic thing that happens. The gear dies, any slaves in the, in the any Gentile slaves in the, in the convert's um, domain or in his property automatically gain their freedom, even if they're minors. Okay, and therefore... The story could have happened with a minor as well, is what this one is saying. Because if it happened with a minor, also the slave would have acquired himself. And that's why Merzutra had to tell him, go do a job for me, so that that automatic freedom, ticket to freedom, didn't click in. Okay, and that's how he was able to acquire him. Just to point out, Abishal's opinion, Abishal obviously says the opposite, if they were older of age, they would be able to acquire themselves. But Ketanim don't get that freedom and therefore call them Anyone who acquires them would have, right, anyone who, who picks them up, you know, kind of takes them into their house would acquire them. So basically, or you could say Makzik Chazaka, you know, as soon as the slave starts working for them, they acquire them. In any case, the point being that what Rezutra wanted to do was to be the one that the Ebed was working for. Kenyan, why did this come up, by the way? This is Kenyan Chazaka. So that when the guy died, the Ebed would be working for Marzutra, in which case he would be acquired immediately by Marzutra and wouldn't gain his freedom. And there's just a machloka, was he a katana or a gadol? Because with this concern that Marzutra had to do this in order to pre prevent the slave from going free, is it only concern for a gadol or is it also a concern for a katan, depending on how you hold on that machloka. So what we've talked about today so far is Kinyan Chazaka of an Eved, 
And Kinyan Hagbaha, can you actually lift him? Is that a way of doing a Kinyan? Machlok at Rabbi Shimon and the rabbis. And then we moved on. We had this side question. If, if Hagba works, what about a Shifcha Knanit having relations with this, with this, with her master? And then again, which again, it's not clear if it was rape or not rape. It seems to be consensual, although tough to know really what they're talking about. Again, I really think that all is very theoretical. And they're just trying to say this sounds absurd, that lifting should work because if lifting should work, we could come to come some absurd conclusion that a master could acquire his 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 Canaanite slave by having relations with her and that would be that's just not right it's not true and it's not listed there or anything else but in any case we dealt with that and then we moved on to this other story where you see this in action this Kenyan Chazak now we're moving on to let's say the more complicated part of today's studio which is trying to understand the Mishnah we saw yesterday so let's go back to the second part of the Mishnah first part of the Mishnah like all these Mishnah it starts with how do you acquire something and then the question is, how do they get their freedom? How do they undo it? So, Koneh Datsmo, how does he acquire his freedom in the Mishnah? I'm in the second sentence in the Mishnah. Bekesef al yidei acharim, bishtar al yidei atzmo. Either money that other people pay for him, pay his freedom, or a document, he gets a shar shechor himself, meaning the master gives it to him. Next, that's Rabbi Meir. Chachamim say the exact opposite. Kesef al yidei atzmo, the money he gets only if he pays himself, or it seems only, ubishtar al yidei achirim, and with a document, if the master gives the document of freedom to only to other people. Okay, so they have the exact, it's like a crisscross, X, right? Each one says the opposite of the other. And it sounds pretty clear from the Mishnah, and the, they just add this one thing, ubevachia kesef mishal achirim, when he does kesef by himself, as long as, right, he doesn't have his own money at all, because all this money is the master's, as long as someone gives him the money to pay his way out. Now, we have to understand, right now we assume there's two opinions. Soon we're going to see, because we can't explain it any other way, there's actually three opinions here. Okay, that's eventually what we're going to get to, but right now we're going to try to understand the first opinion, Rabbi Meir. From the Chachamim, we're going to end up making a split here in the wording of the Mishnah, and understand the Mishnah not in its simple reading, because it's not really going to make sense. Konet, that's Mobekesev. And we're going to see, number one, there's going to be a three-way machloket. Number two, it's, the machloket is going to be based on how people hold in three different areas. And this is what you can see on the first chart on the study guide. Bekesev al yidei acherim in, avalo yidei So when Rabbi Meir says he can acquire himself with money, it seems like he's saying money only, right, al yidei acherim, only other people can pay the money, but he himself can't pay the money. So now the question becomes, Bimaya skin, and what's the case? Now the issue is, let's just start, even though they don't say this, let's start with the main issue. The main issue is that Yad Eved ki Yad Rabo, in Kinyan the Kesef below Rabo. That means, in Kinyan the Eved, sorry, below Rabo. If now I'm going to make myself the slave in all these cases, I'm a slave, a Canaanite slave. I can't acquire anything. Anything I acquire goes right to my master. So money doesn't work. I can't go buy my way out because if somebody gives me money to give to my master to buy my way out, the second he gives it to me, it's not mine anymore. So I can't buy my way to freedom. So only other people can buy for me. As long as it doesn't go through me, then they can buy my freedom. But as soon as the money goes to me, it's not my money anymore. So now the question is, why not al yidei Right? It seems like. So I'm sorry. Why of al yidei atzmolo? Sorry. What's the case when it says, Bekesef al yidei That's what they want to know right now. There's going to be two possibilities. Either I know that they're buying my freedom or I don't know that they're buying my freedom. And we're going to play them both out and see that we're going to get stuck here. Bimaya skina. Ile ma shalomidato. Now, if you're going to say, I don't know anything about it, you go and decide to pay my way out of slavery and I don't know, well, that can't possibly work. Why doesn't it work? Because that's based on a different machloket. There's a machloket, we've seen this before. Well, let's talk about not the machloket. The halacha is, zachin la'adam shalo b'fanav ve'en chavin la'adam shalo b'fanav. That means, if you accept a gift on my behalf, I don't know about it, but it's good for me because it's a gift, right? Let's say if someone decides to give me a piece of land and I'm not there and they go to you and they say, will you acquire this for Michelle? Of course you can acquire it. It's just good for me. Unless you say maybe owning land is a big responsibility, maybe not good, but, but you always have to decide is something good or not good, but some things that look good sometimes aren't so good. But let's say it's a good thing for me. You can acquire it on my behalf. 
But if it's bad for me, you obviously can't acquire something that's bad for me, that's a chov, it's going to create problems for me down the road. Again, what chov is is a good question. That's why there's going to be a machloket here. Is going free a chov or a schut? We talked about this in, in Get as well, in uh, Gitim. So a slave being freed, a Gentile slave being freed. So we talked about before what happens when he gets freed, he becomes a full-fledged Jew. And he keeps all the mitzvot, and he gets to marry a Jewish woman, but he loses some things also, okay? In other words, the question becomes, is it schut for the other to get free, or is it bad? Okay, schut, we'd always rather be free, right? Number two, it's nice they can marry a Jewish woman, they can keep all the mitzvot, that's a schut, because you get schut for keeping mitzvot and all that. That's one option. But Rabbi Meir says it's a chov, okay? And that's what we're going to see right now. If it's a chov, okay, which we'll get to in a minute, why it's a chov, but then what? You can't pay my way out without my knowing because in chavim adam ela befanaf. Now, why is it a chov? So some people say, okay, well, first of all, we talked about all this in Gitin. If I work for a Kohen, then I get to eat truma. And if basically you free me, I won't be able to eat truma anymore. So that's a chov. Number two, I'm permitted to a shivcha kna'anit when I'm a slave, right? Because I'm a Gentile, so I can be with a shivcha kna'anit. Right? It's not the same as the Eved Ivri with the shivcha kna'anit, but anyway. But once I'm freed, right? Part of the change of status is marry, who you can marry, who you can't marry. I can no longer be with a shivcha kna'anit, okay? Assuming I'm a man. And I have to only be with Jewish women. So that is viewed as a chov. Why is it a chov? It's a little bit of an unpleasant answer they give because... You know, I'd rather have someone who's more heft care like, you know, she doesn't care so much and it's just like easier. It's, I can, I don't know, I don't, I don't even want to go there what exactly the whole reason is there. But basically, you can think of other reasons. I mean, as a slave, I get my food taken care of, I get all that stuff. It doesn't say that in the Gemara, but also, theoretically, that's a, that's a more, I would think, obvious reason. In any case, let's go back to the Gemara. So if it's Shalomi Dato, that's option number one. That you pay the money for me and I don't even know about it, well, definitely that doesn't work because we're trying to explain Rabbi Meir's opinion and we know that Rabbi Meir holds elsewhere. He views it as a chov. Now they're building all the things that I just said and it says in a bright I think it's even a Mishnah. You can't do something that's bad for me if I don't know about it. So it can't be that you're paying money without my knowledge. Okay, so process of elimination, it must be midato. Well, that's also going to create a problem. Why? Because listen, what did Rabbi Meir say? Kesef, only other people can pay. Shtar, I can accept. But it sounds like not achirim because he said shtar yedat smo. So el apshita midato. So now the Gemara says it must be midato. It must be I know. You pay with my knowledge. The hakamash malan, and what it's trying to tell you is, that's, why is it saying? It's saying al yedat achirim in Okay, before we get to the problem, let's just spell this all out. Rabbi Meir is saying, if you pay for me without, with my knowledge, it works. Okay, because I know about it, so obviously it works. And but I can't do it myself, and that's for another reason. That's why I said this is all, all these opinions are based on a number of different, of different topics, different issues. Doesn't work that I pay the money because if you give me money to buy my way out, the second you give me the money, it goes straight to the master. There's no such thing. I can't acquire anything without my master acquiring it because I'm his his um, property. So anything I get goes straight to him, which means I can't do it myself. What's the problem with this interpretation? That again, we want to say it's all midato. You gave the money with my knowledge. Well, what does the end part say of this Mishnah? And part of Rabbi Meir's words, Bishtar Yedatzmo, which means I can get my own star though, but we assume it means Al Yedatzmo Lo In Al Yedachirim Lo. But it sounds like when it comes to star, you can't accept the star on my behalf. Now, Imidato, if we said we're talking about where I know about it and I want it, Al Yedachirim Amai Lo, why can't you accept the star on my behalf? If you can give the money on my behalf, you should be able to accept the star on my behalf. And we assume that Rabbi Meir, when he says, al yidat smo the star, that he means you can only get this emancipation document by yourself, not someone else can't accept it on your behalf. So now we're a little bit stuck. Because Shalom Midato didn't work, but Midato doesn't work with the second part. So, right, Shalom Midato doesn't work with the first part, because in Chavim Ladam Shalom B'Fanav, so you can't do it with money without me, my knowing. But the second part, why wouldn't you be able to accept my emancipation document 
on behalf of me if I know about it. So, well, the first obvious answer would be to say, just because Rabbi Meir said shtari datsmo doesn't necessarily mean he means I can, I'm the only one who can accept it. Maybe it means even shtar al yedatsmo, meaning kesef, only you can do for me. Shtar, you can do, or even I can accept myself. Now, why did he specifically talk about myself? Well, hakamashman, he wanted to teach you. Third issue. Okay, again, we had, is it a chov or not for the eved? And you can look at the chart. It's all charted out there. Is it, is, can anyone acquire anything on their own? No, the slave can't acquire anything on his own. Everything goes to the master. And the third issue is, Well, maybe what it's trying to say is, besides, obviously, that you can accept the star on my behalf, even though everything I own goes straight to my master, there's one exception to that rule, and what is it? When I get my get shichror, I get my hand at the same time. I, I acquire the ability to accept that star at the moment he gives it to me. When he gives me or anyone gives me money, it goes straight to the master. But if he's giving me an emancipation document, because it's my freedom document, as soon as it comes into my hand, it's as if I become free at that moment and I can accept it. We learned that with the woman, right? The gita v'yada ba'in ke'echad. So also, she can, right? We learned all sorts of halachot about it. Anyway, we're not going to get into that right now. So maybe that's what it means. And then we resolve the issue again. It's mida. It's I know about it. Star, so kesef only works with other people because I can't acquire money at all on my own. But when it comes to the star, I can acquire my star at the same time as my freedom. That, that all works. But, and obviously it works if other people do it for me because it's with my knowledge. But that sounds all really nice and good and makes perfect logical sense. What's the problem? It doesn't work because there's a ton of edict source that says that's not what Rabbi Meir holds. Our Mishnah only talked about kesef by Asma, star by other people. Didn't I'm sorry, kesef by other people, star for me. Didn't say what about right other people with the star. So we just made an assumption. Maybe it means even myself, meaning also other people. But there's a bright to this says explicitly that that's not Rabbi Meir holds. It doesn't say that. It says in a bright so this whole logical argument that we built doesn't work because it says explicitly in a bright that the Rabbi Meir doesn't allow me to get my freedom by the master giving a document of freedom to somebody else on my behalf. So we're back to square one. So we started with, is it midato, shalom midato? We said it must be midato because it doesn't make sense. Shalom midato because ain't chavin la'adam shalom b'fanav, right? You can't do something bad for me. Rabbi Meir holds that this is bad if I don't know about it. So we're going to now say that this is an exception to the rule. Am Rabbi, lo olam shalom idato. Really, you're giving the money without my knowledge. Why does it work? Well, shani kesef. Kesef in buying out the slave is a unique case. Why is it unique? Ho'il v'kane le'ba'al korche, makne le'ba'al korche. This is very interesting logic. Abai says, when you're a slave, you get sold into slavery, or let's say I'm owned by one Gentile owner. I'm sorry. Let's say I'm owned by a Jewish owner. I'm a Gentile slave owned by a Jewish owner, and he sells me to his friend. Do I have a choice in the matter? No. I have no choice in the matter. So when I got bought with money and you know sold into slavery to somebody else or sold from one owner to another, it was against my will. So likewise, I can get out of it even without my knowledge. Against my will and not without my knowledge are kind of similar. Right? So if it works against my will is even stronger to go into slavery, I can actually get out of slavery against my will. And that's why with money it works. What's the problem? Well, then it should work by star also. Ihachi, star nami. And we had this whole sugya earlier, the same comparison earlier in the Masechet. Hai star lechud ve hai star lechud. Money going in, you know, I got sold with money, I got bought with money, money, money is all the same. Star is different. One star is a star kinyan acquiring, and one star is an emancipation document. Those are two totally different things. So that's why you can't say, since you went in with the star, you went out with the star, even against my will, because that star is not the same as that star. They're two totally different things. They might be both called a star, both a document. They're two very different documents. One is a bill of sale, one is a bill of manumission. So now they say, well, on that same note, you could say, the money that acquired me is not the same money as, right? That was this you know, hundred dollar bill, and that was a different hundred dollar bill, or whatever it is, right? It, it's not the same money. To say, no. 
they're all the same coins. In other words, money isn't called different money. The fact that I use this $100 bill for that and that $100 bill for the other one, it's still all a $100 bill. It makes no difference. They're all the same. So we have this exact same sugya earlier. So in which case, Habai basically answers. We go back to changing what we said in the beginning. It's actually against my will, but it works because it's a unique halacha here. Since money got me in against my will, money can get me out against my will. Okay. Rava sticks with Abai but changes it a little bit. Kesef Kabbalah, he agrees that it's against my will, and that's the only way to explain it. Otherwise, again, if I know, not against my will, against my, I, did, I didn't know about it. Because again, if I knew about it, then it should definitely work by Shtar, and Rabbi Mayer clearly holds it doesn't. So that's why we have to say it's, I knew about it. I'm sorry, I didn't know about it, and yet it works anyway. So why is that? Well, the heat gives a different distinction between money and Shtar. Kesef Kabbalat Rabo Garmada. Things go work very differently with Kesef and Shtar. What happens if you buy my freedom? You give money to the master. So how really am I, is my freedom acquired? The master is the main person. He's the one who does it. So it's not really like you did it for me because it's true you gave the money. But if the master didn't accept it, then it wouldn't work. So the master is really the one making it happen. That's why you can do it for me because you're not really doing anything for me because the master is really doing it all. Shtar, Kabbalat Achirim Garmado. But what happens in the star? The opposite. The master gives the, the emancipation document to you for me. So you, if you didn't accept it, it wouldn't be anything. So there, you're really making it all happen. And that can't work because I don't even know about it. So that's a second interpretation. Now we're going to move to Chachamim. Chachamim will blame Bekesef al-Yideatzmo. So now we're going to again do the same inference. We assume when he says Bekesef al-Yideatzmo, Bekesef al-Yideatzmo, Ina, Yidea Chirim, Lo. It sounds like. Kesef only works if I pay the money myself, but not other people. Am I? Why not? Why can't you pay for me? Nihi nami de right? Even if you say, let's go with the obvious, I don't know about it, and ain't coming la dame la befana. But what's the problem? The rabbis hold, mifti shamina lu la rabbanan da amre schutu, shiat semi tachat yad rabo la chayrut. The rabbis go with the other approach. It's actually good for the slave to be freed because he could do mitzvot, all the reasons we gave before. It's a benefit. He's free. I always bet. Which means, even if I don't know about it, you should be able to free me. So that doesn't make any sense. So why can't other people do it? Right? So it doesn't make any sense. So we have to figure out why only I can do the money and not you. Well, maybe it means, like we suggested earlier, Maybe al Yadatzmo means even I can pay the money, and it's a reaction to Rabbi Meir. You think only other people can pay the money because I can't acquire money at all. Well, I think even I can pay my own way out. Vikamash and what it's trying to teach you is Yesh Kenyama Eve Below Rabo, that I can acquire things on my own. Ihachi, but there's a problem with this. Because why? Well, now let's go to the second part. Same exact structure as what we did before. We suggest something and then said it doesn't match the end part of the mission. What is the end part of Divrei Chachamim? Em asefa b'shtar al yedei achirim, but shtar only right with others, which means not al yedei atzmo. Now, why can't I get my own shtar? Ha kaimalan degito biyado bein kecha. Don't we learn that when I get my emancipation document, at that moment I acquire my freedom, and then I have a hand to accept the document. Bechitem amay yedei achirim, af yedei achirim. So if you want to say that the second part is doing the same thing as the first and saying. Well, the focus here is other people can get my star, even in addition to me obviously being able to accept my own star. And what it's trying to say is, even you can accept my star, even if I don't know about it, because it's a schud, and then that matches chachamim, and then all works well. But what's the problem? What we're basically saying is the words of chachamim, which say. Kesef by yourself, star others, really means Kesef others and yourself, and even yourself, and star yourself and even others. Well, basically what you're saying is star and Kesef work whether you do it or whether other people do it, which makes sense from what we've learned from Chachamim, that everything should work, but what's the problem? The language of the Mishnah makes no sense then. They should have put it all together. If the, if the mission wanted to say both work in both cases, then it should have said, That's the way the mission should have said it. It should have said, Kesef and Shtar both work 
for you or others. And then that would have made perfect sense, but that's not what it says in the Mishnah. The Mishnah says, Kesef, by, your, by yourself, and Shtar, I'm sorry, uh, sorry, I just said it wrong, right? Kesef, no, I said it right? Yeah, Kesef, by yourself, Shtar, others, which doesn't sound like both work for both cases. So, Ela, the Kesef, Ben al Yideh Acherim, Ben al Yideh Atzmo, Bishtar, al Yideh Acherim, Velo al Yideh Atzmo. So now we're going to read the Mishnah like this. When it says Kesef, al Yideh Atzmo, it means, just like Rabbi Meir said, other people, even yourself, okay, so the first part is both you and others, and Bishtar, al Yideh Acherim, Velo al Yideh Atzmo. But Shtar, only others. Be Rabbi Shimon Ben Elazarhu. But it's not the rabbis. In other words, how do we resolve this? We basically say that when it said the first line about Kesef, the rabbis were reacting to Rabbi Meir and said, you think only others can pay the money? I think even the Evid can pay his own way out. Because the Evid can acquire, you, there is a way that you can give the money to the Evid just for the Evid. Okay? And then he can buy his way out. And then, he doesn't even relate to Shtar. Shtar, he also thinks, will work, Ben al Yideh Atzmo, Ben al Yideh Acherim. The rabbis. But the next line where it says Shtar al Yideh Acherim is actually someone else's opinion. There's a third opinion here. Again, it's very hard to read the Mishnah this way, but they're stuck because otherwise the Mishnah makes no sense. So that is Rabbi Shem ben Elazar. Ditani. Rabbi Shem ben Elazar omel, af bishtar yideh acherim velo al yideh atzmo. Rabbi Shem ben Elazar says, even Shtar is only others and not atzmo. So if we pull up the chart for a minute, we'll do a good review of these shito because otherwise it's hard to understand. So I made a nice chart at the top, which is Rabbi Meir holds Kesef only works by others. Why? Because an Evid can't acquire anything. Star works only by himself because, uh, because, right, oh, and by the, right, and also Kesef al-Yideacherim would have to be that I know about it because it's a chov, and a chov can't happen unless I know. Star I can get myself because gito biyado ba'in ke'echad. Okay? Now, and, and the star, sorry, I just said something wrong. I said it according to Avamina. It's against my will. I, sorry, not against. It's I didn't know about it. In the end, the conclusion was I didn't know about it. Kesef still works, right? The star doesn't work by others because I didn't know about it. Had I known about it, right? And because I don't know about it, you can't do it without me. And that's why star doesn't work by others doing it. Kesef works because others do it because Kesef is a unique halacha. Since I got in against my will, I can go out against my will or the explanation of Rava. Now we move to the rabbis. The rabbis, even though they don't appear fully in the Mishnah, they only appear partially about the Kesef, hold the Kesef and Shtar work, whether it's me, whether it's others, because, number one, they think it's a schut, so anyone could do it for me even against, even if I don't know about it. And there is a way that I could get my own money, and Gito Adoba in Ke'echad, and I could get my own Shtar. So everyone can get my Shtar for me or give money for me because they're operating in place of me to do something that's good for me. And I can even do myself because there is a way that someone could give me money to pay my way out. Or my star can be by myself. Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, though, holds, and most of the Mepharshim think by Kesef also, because it only says by star, but Kesef and star, it seems, only others. Okay? And we're going to, and then basically you'd have to say, number one, schut, it's a good thing for me, and that's why other people can do it for me. But, number one, en kenyan la'eve below rabo. I can't acquire anything, so I can't do anything myself. And even the star, I can't because Gito Viado don't come. He doesn't agree with this whole theory that Gito Viado by Inkechat. So that's a good review of all the approaches. So now let's go back to the Gemara. And the Gemara says, Where's Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar? So that we read. Vishalosh machlokot bedavar. And there's three machlokot here, which could mean one of two things. It actually means both, though. I don't know if the Gemara meant both, but there's three opinions as opposed to two, it seemed in the Mishnah. And there's three issues that are at the core of this entire debate. Gito biyado, yesh kinyan la'eve below rabo, and is it a schud or a chova for the eved to leave. Amarab, my time at Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar. Where does Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar get this from? Gamar la la mi'isha. We learned this right. This is the Rishava. La appears by the woman in the get, and la appears also by the by the slave getting out. Ma'isha ad shiotzi get the reshut she'en ha'shelo. When the woman gets her get, it has to go, Natan biyadad, has to go into her own domain, which for the woman's case is different from the slave because a woman is not owned by her husband. She's married to him, but she's not owned by him. So as soon as he puts it in her hand, it's hers. Right? That's why it says, Natan biyadad, because it has to be in her domain. He can't just leave it in his house and say, here, it's, it's there for you. 
Okay? Has to go into her domain. So the get also has to be given to a domain that's not the owner's. And since the Evid is com- completely owned by the husband, there's no way to give it to the slave. So you can only give it to some third party that can acquire it on his behalf. And that's why even star, even money. By Rava, going now to Amabe. Rava now asks, Le Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, Evik nani, mao shi ase shaliach lekabel gitom yad rabo. Well, can a shaliach appoint someone to do it? Now, generally, when you do shlichut, right, do we say, here, let's read the both sides in the Gemara, kevin de gamar la la mi isha, ki isha. Maybe we say, okay, zera shava to a woman, just like a woman can appoint someone to accept her get. We saw a lot of that in Gitin. So, can a shaliach. O Dilma, right, and this is according to the person who says, though, that you can't accept the get yourself, but you can appoint a shaliach. O Dilma, isha di ihi matzi mekabal gita, shaliach nami matzi mishavia. A woman can appoint a shaliach to accept her get because she herself can accept the get. But Eved, di'i hu lo makabal gita, but an Eved who can't actually do it himself, shaliach nami lo matzi mishavi. Maybe he can't appoint a shaliach, right? What is shlichut? Shlichot shal adam kemoto. Shaliach operates in place of me. Now, if I can't do it myself, then I can't appoint a shaliach to do something that I can't do myself. So that's the question. Batar de bayahad or pashta. After he asked the question, he answered it. La la mi isha ki isha. He actually can't do it because of the Gzair Shavit to a woman. So we learn whatever is true for a woman is true for the slave. Since a woman can get her own get, can appoint a shaliach to get her own get, this shaliach can as well. Now they say, Ella, hada amar Rav Huna b'reita Rav Yeshua. But listen to what Rav Huna b'reita Rav Yeshua said. This is in a different sugi that we saw twice already in Yoma and in uh, Nidarim. Hane kahane. Kohanim are shluchei de Rachmana Ninim. They are messengers of God. When Kohanim do our korbanot, there's a question. Are they operating in place of God, or are they operating as our messenger? I'm supposed to give a korban, but I can't because I'm not a Kohen. I can't sacrifice it in the temple, so the Kohen does it on my behalf. So is the Kohen operating on my behalf as my messenger or God's messenger? To which they say, so Rav Huna, Rav Yeshua said they're obviously operating as shlichim of God and not as mine. So they say, it can't be our shaliach, because if I can't do the korbanot myself, then obviously you can't be my shaliach as a kohen to do what I can't do myself. So it seems very clear here that there's no such thing as shlichut if I can't do it myself. And what did we say? Velo, didn't we just say, v'ha avda, the ihu lo matzi mekabal gite, v'shliach matzi meshavet. But an evet can't accept a get, and yet is get shechur, his emancipation document, and yet can appoint a shaliach. So those things don't necessarily go hand in hand. So why was it so obvious that they're operating as shlichim of God? Theoretically, they could be my shaliach, and I can appoint a shaliach even to do something I can't do myself. Vilohi, but that's not true. It's not a fair comparison, they say, because Yisrael lo shaychei b'torah korbanot kala eved shayach begitim. Why? So Yisrael, I can never do a korban if I'm not a kohen, a male kohen. I can never do it. But an eved can accept a get now. We just said an Ebed can't accept his get, but I can accept a get for somebody else. If I'm an Ebed Knani, now how does it work? The whole problem with giving the star to me, again, we're in Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar here. Not all the opinions agree with this. Most disagree, right? Everyone else disagrees with him on this point. But according to Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, if you give me the star Shechor, it automatically is yours, which means I'm not freed because I don't have my own ability to accept that star. But if you give it to, if you give it to my friend, who's in Evid Knani in someone else's house, as soon as you give it to him, it, does, it might go to his Adon, but that doesn't matter. That got me free. Because I can, so theoretically, any Evid Knani can accept a get shikhor. Titania, let's read it inside. It seems to be that I can accept a get on behalf of a different Evid Knani, as long as his master isn't my master. Right? I just can't accept to get shikhor from my own master. Because from my own master, it will just revert right back to him. From someone else's master, it might revert to my master, but that will actually free the slave. Because as long as the slave leaves, what's the star shikhor? You're leaving the domain of your own master. So since that's not the same as korbanot. Korbanot I can never do. But star shikhor I actually theoretically could accept. Okay. Now we're going to go back to this machloka between Rabbi Meir and the rabbis about whether... I can accept. My, I can get money from you to give it to my master. Chachamim say yes. Rabbi Meir says no. So what's the basis of the machloket? 
Nema bahaka mifle. Let's assume this is the root of the machlok. Do Rabbi Meir sabal ain kinyan la eve below rabo, be ain kinyan li sha below baala. Rabbi Meir says there's no such thing as getting, you can't, if you want to gift something to me and I'm an eve kinani or I'm married, it can't go to me. It goes straight to my husband or straight to my master. Be Rabbanan savle, yesh kinyan la eve below rabo, be yesh kinyan li sha below baala. No. If my father wants to give me a gift, he can give me a gift and say, I want this to be yours, and that works. And the rabbis think that works. So likewise, if I'm a Nebuchadnezzar, you can give me money and say, I want this to be yours, and it could be mine. So normally, anything I gain will go straight to my master. But if someone specifies, then it's mine. That's the assumption that is their machlok. But now we're going to have two different explanations, and with that, we'll finish the da'ah. Both of them think there's no such thing. And So the case is, the someone gave me a hundred, hundred of money, right, a manet, and said, this is on the condition that your master not have access to this money. Rabbi Meir Savar ki amrle kne. As soon as he said acquire this money, kana eve v'kana rabe, it immediately went to the the master, which means the whole rest of his sentence was disregarded. This almanat, this condition, is totally irrelevant. Ki amrle almanat lo klum ka amrle, it's nothing. The rabbanan savre rabbanan hol ke vanda amrle almanat ahane leitnei. Since you you gave a condition, the stipulation kicks in. So normally it would go to my master, but this stipulation actually overrides that. And that's why it would work. Rabbi Lazar Amal, Koki Agavna de Kule Amalo Pligi, de Kane Eve Vekane Rabe. Okay, he's actually, it's very confusing because the last one was En Kinyan La Eve Below Rabo, and this is Kane Eve Kane Rabe. It's the exact same thing, just one is worded in the negative, one is worded in the positive. Everyone agrees that whatever the Eve acquires, the master acquires. The Hacha Bemayaskinam, but he changes something minor, or maybe not minor. In the, in the case just before, they said, what was the issue? According to Chachamim, it was a case where he said, al minat, al minat would work. If they st- gave a stipulation that this is not going to your master, right? And then you get the money and you can buy your freedom. But according to the second opinion of Rabbi Elazal, same thing, someone gave me a maneh, but said, use this money for your freedom. In other words, I'm giving you this money. This is like someone gives you money and says, only if you use it for this, only if you use it for your freedom. Now, in this case, basically, the Evid never gets the money. There's no Kenyan on the money. The money is only given under the condition to be used for freedom. It's kind of like saying we bypass the, the slave here. He gives it physically to the slave, but it's never acquired by the slave. If it was acquired by the slave, it would go straight to his master. But you avoid it being acquired because you basically say it's under the condition that this is your freedom money. So when he physically hands it over to the Adon, it was never his really in the first place. Because it only kicks in, the ownership switches when the owner says, okay, I'll take this and give you your freedom. So Rabbi Meir Saval, again, Rabbi Meir doesn't agree with this. As soon as he says, take this money, it already went straight to the master. But And the stipulation after was irrelevant. But Rabbi Meir Saval, you really, he really didn't give him the money. It was just use this for your freedom, which means that the, the acquiring never really happened until it got to the hands of the master. And that's why it would work. So we have three ways here to understand what the machloka between Rabbi Meir and the rabbis is. First, we thought it was en kinyan, right? Is it yesh kinyan la'eve? Can he acquire something or can't he? Then it was no. No one thinks you can acquire in both the second explanations. It's just a matter of what if you stipulate, I'm overriding that halacha, does it work? Or what if you stipulate, it's really not going to go through you, even though I'm going to technically give it to you, and maybe only that case, it would work according to the rabbis. So what we saw today, okay, after we got through the beginning part about Kenyan Hagbaha, when it comes to Avadim, then we moved to this machloket between, we thought it was Rabbi Meir Chachamim, about Kesef and, Sh- and Shtar, who is able to do it, we thought it was a crisscross. This one, yes. This one, no. This one, yes. This one, no. In the end, we saw that, number one, there weren't only two opinions. There were three opinions. And the rabbis said one and not the other, but they really meant one and the other. And in the end, the rabbis' opinion is actually, it works both for the person, both for Achirin. And Rabbi Shem ben Lazar was the last line in the mission about the shtar, which was shtar only al Achirin, and that was Rabbi Shem ben Lazar's position. And again, each position was based on 
holding different things about three different issues that I'm not going to review again now because it's late. And then we got to, once we heard Rabbi Shimon ben Elazal, then we had a few questions about him. You know, how can he make a shaliach if he can't even do it himself? And then we got to this, what's the real machloket about the kesef, the money, between Rabbi Meir and the rabbis and gave three suggestions. That's it for today. Wishing everyone a great day.